Thank you. I'll hand you over to Martin Emerson. Okay. I do want to start, firstly, thanks to everyone for coming, and, and actually thanks also to the, to the museum, to Manchester Museum, who've put this on, event on for us, and I think it's, a, it, it's brilliant, because it's a lovely venue, but also it's really great, because what we have here is two and a half year, million years of human history, and actually that's what the book covers, that covers that, uh, that, that, that period of time and all those different ways that humans have organised their lives and their societies and so on, and you'll be glad to know that I don't intend to talk about two and a half million years of human history tonight, um, today, uh, it would take too long. Um, and uh, instead, what I'm going to try and do is draw out some of the main themes of the, uh, of the book and show some pretty pictures and, uh, and really encourage you to, 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 to read it in order to, uh, to get to the main point. And the main <coughs> point, as Emma has suggested, which is that we live in very, very dangerous times. We live, you know, I'm sure comrades have seen on the news the floods and, uh, and so on, but the, you know, the freezing weather that's covered North America, the unusual and extreme uh, uh, weather patterns and climatic <coughs> changes that we're we're facing, and uh, these are dangerous dangerous times. And I'm not going to spend today much time talking about the environmental crisis, climate change, global warming, because that's a big part of the book. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is I felt that people needed an opportunity to try and understand some of the science of climate change, what causes it, but also how actually relatively simple and straightforward the solutions to global warming are, and why they haven't yet been been implemented, and maybe that's something that people would like to talk about in the, uh, in, the, in, in the discussion after my, my introduction. What I'm going to try and do today, though, is to put that current environmental ecological crisis that humans face, that our society faces, in the context of, of, of really of two million years of human, of human history, two million years where humans have related to and changed <coughs> the natural world in all sorts of different ways, and we'll, we'll look at some of that in a minute. Um, that have culminated, I would argue, in a, in a world system, a capitalist system, that can only see the natural world as something to exploit in the interests of production, or as a repository for the waste from production, um, and really has environmental and ecological destruction at its heart. I mean, while I was looking at some of the stuff this morning on the news, I was struck by the fact that at the same time they're telling all of us that we have to recycle more, we have to use our cars less and all the rest of it to, to try and avoid climate change and to, to reduce the emissions. Um, there are t t something like 90 companies, 90 companies that are responsible for just over two-thirds of global emissions ever. Two of them, Chevron and BP, are responsible for 5% of global emissions for the whole of human history. So it doesn't matter what we do in this room, unless we find a way of challenging that madness, that, 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 that lunacy of a, of a system geared towards profit, and we'll come back to this, we will be in deep, in deep trouble. I said that the system we're geared at, that we live in now, is geared very much to seeing the, the natural world in terms of how it can be used in the interests of making money and, uh, and, uh, and profit and so on. But what the book looks at is the fact that for most of human history, that's actually not been true. How we've related to nature has been very, very, very different. And uh, having said that, though, humans have always altered the natural world around them. In fact, most of the exhibits in this museum, or, or, or indeed in this room, are examples of tools and things that have been made. Have a look next door when you, when you leave at the different bows and arrows, the spears, the, uh, 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 the, the, the implements that humans, thousands of different ways, in a myriad of different uh, ways, have, uh, have changed the, the natural, natural world. They've hunted, they've chopped down trees, grown crops, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And uh, the book is written from a, a Marxist point of view, and Karl Marx makes it absolutely clear how humans are related to the natural world. The first historical act he wrote is the production of material life itself, the sense that humans, the first time they make history, actually they're doing it, try, trying to improve their lives, get food, shelter, and, uh, and the rest of it. And they've done this through, through their labour. Labour, he writes, is the appropriation of nature for the satisfaction of human needs. But our relationship with nature uh, has also done something else. It's not simply been the backdrop to human history. It's also reflected the changes and indeed the antagonisms and the battles that have taken place in human history. If you just take one example of the way we've changed nature in the biggest and largest way, agriculture. Agriculture isn't simply farming. Agriculture is also a site of class war. People have fought for the right to have land, fought for the right to control the produce of their land, fought for the right to not have to give away two-thirds of the crop to the local landlord and you know, to feed their families and so on. And, and these, these battles are part of, of the ecological history that, that humans have, and they've also affected, and I'll show you that a little, little bit in a minute, they've affected how our landscape and our, and our world looks and, uh, and, uh, and, and exists. 
So, what I'm trying to basically say as a way of starting is that the natural world that we see around us when we go out into the countryside or, or, or go on holiday or whatever is not really a pristine natural world. It's the product of thousands of years of human work, human labour. And uh, we'll start by looking at a picture of, uh, of uh, the Norfolk Broads. Thanks, delight. See, Norfolk Broads are a beautiful part of the world. Everyone who likes bird watching goes there. You go there for nice and relaxing and tranquil. It's a nice part to, to escape the rigours of capitalism and so on. People mark on it for its nature and for its, uh, its beauty and so on, but the Norfolk Broads are completely artificial. They were created at the beginning of the Middle Ages by the extraction of peat for burning in, uh, in people's homes for, for fuel on an enormous scale, something like 900 million cubic metres of peat were, were, were dug out of the ground. And had there not been a flood in the year 1287, you wouldn't have the Norfolk Broads today. You would have even larger excavations. So just one little example of how nature, that we see something as pristine and natural, actually is the product of, uh, uh, of decades, centuries, thousands of years of, uh, of, of, of human, human labour. And of course what happened is when those broads were flooded, then all sorts of, you know, nature took its uh, took back and, you know, all sorts of ecological systems developed, you know, birds evolved, took up nesting and lived there and, and so on, and humans lived that world and, and, and that place in a different world. There's a sort of constant change and, and process going on in the, uh, in the uh, natural world. And there's, there's, there's thousands of examples. You go across, uh, uh, across the, um, uh, the Pennines, you know, the Pennines, people love them because it's open moorland and, you know, it's beautiful and desolate and raining. And, um, uh, and <laughs> it's my experience. Um, but of course, that again is completely artificial. It's been cut, you know, deforested in the Bronze and Iron Ages by people who were cutting down the trees to, uh, to create agricultural landscape. You know, the idea of a pristine natural world. And we, we continue, it's not just a historic thing, we continue to do it today. Here's a picture of Wyoming in, uh, uh, in the United States after the local state there said that it was entirely appropriate for people to. Uh, to continue fracking there and, uh, and drag out their gas, and all of these are the remains of fracking uh, uh, sites that have been, you know, uh, uh, cleared out and then and then left. And you know, as we all protest and campaign in Barton Moss against the, the fracking, we have in the back of our heads that actually, if we don't stop them, they will do it on a larger, on a larger, on a larger scale. And the final example of this, uh, I mean, because it's the anniversary of the start of the First World War. There's a mountain in uh, in the Alps, in the French Alps that in 1918 was 20 feet shorter than it was in 1914 because the battles had been so intense, the artillery fired. So even things like mountains that we could think of as almost eternal are in themselves being shaped by human, human life and, uh, and, uh, and human uh, existence. Um, now I said, how do we change nature? How do we change the natural world? And obviously I alluded to, to Marx's quote about, about labour and, uh, and tools. Here is the most successful human tool ever invented. For one and a half million years, humans used uh, hand axes like this. This is from Tanzania, made about a million years ago. And uh, uh, so successful, used in tens of, in tens of thousands of these hand axes were made, hundreds of thousands around the world. There's, there's lots of different examples from them up, upstairs, if you want to go and have a look around the, uh, around the galleries up there. Um, used by all sorts of different people in different parts of the world and for, 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 th for a very long time. Tanzania axes, so you can find them that date from over a, a period of over a, over a million years. But actually, if you go upstairs, there's a hand axe on display there which uh, was found, um, that was brought back from the Caribbean because some European colonists went there in the 1700s and found people using, still using tools like this. So an immensely successful way of altering and changing and, uh, and, 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 and labouring on, uh, on the natural world. And this, it's not because it's the, I'm going to go slightly off topic here, because it's uh, the National Museum. Also upstairs, actually next to the Caribbean handbags, is this wonderful Bronze Age shovel. And it's, it, it's almost unique in, uh, in archaeological remains. It was found in Alderley Edge in the, uh, in the mines there uh, by Bronze Age uh, uh, miners who left it there when the mines were, were, were emptied about uh, 2,000 or so years ago. Um, it's well worth going to see the wonderful story about how the local author and poet Alan Garner discovered it in, the, uh, in, in his school and then carried it in his backpack for years while nobody believed it was real. Anyway, go and have a look at it. It's a wonderful story. Uh, seriously, it's a wonderful story. Right, so as we say, people for tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands, millions of years, used tools like this hand axe and they organised their lives, as we call them, by hunter gatherers. Here is what I'm told is now called a selfie of some hunter-gatherers painted um, around three and a half thousand years ago on the wall of a cave in southern, southern Spain. Here you can see a, a group of hunters uh, hunting reindeer or deer of, of some form, probably with uh, arrows that are tipped with stone or, 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 or like this. Now, one part of the book looks at how hunter-gatherers who 
pictures of themselves here, lived their lives, how their lives were very, very different. They related to the <coughs> natural world in terms of you know, the food that they could gather, the food that they could, they could hunt, but their social life was organised very, very differently, very egalitarian, a very different distribution of labour. You know, men were as likely to be involved in childcare as women and, uh, and, uh, and so on. No classes, no, 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 no hierarchies and you know, collective decision-making about how you live and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And how, that, and how and why that changed is a big part of the, uh, of the book because it's integrated as well with how their relationship to the natural, natural world changed. Now, around 10,000 years ago, in a few different parts of the world, uh, some people like this started to do something that was uh, uh, very, very different, had never been done before. They started to cultivate, and then, then uh, sorry, they, they started domesticating and then cultivating uh, a few types of plants, which allowed the development of uh, agriculture. Uh, and agriculture is very important because obviously it feeds us, but it also transformed and allowed human society to. Uh, have the potential to completely change the natural world. We're very lucky actually because what we have here on the red top is a Egyptian uh, scythe, one-handed scythe for cutting grain. Um, that's 3,700 or so years ago. I've become have a look at it because it, again it's quite unusual. Uh, it's still got the little blades cemented in uh, all these thousands of years. Years later, an example of you know, very <coughs> early, uh, uh types of farming and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and agriculture. Now, farming is important because for the first time in human history, uh, societies were able to produce more food than the people living in them needed. So what you could end up with, didn't always happen, but you could end up with, with a, uh, a society where some people didn't have to do any work because they could live off the labour of other people. And agriculture thus, for the first time in human history, about 10,000 years ago, lays the basis for what we now call class society. Societies differentiated by different, different uh, 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 groups in society with different interests. Um, and we'll come back to that. I just want to go through a very, very fast and rapid history of agriculture. Here we have uh, Neolithic agriculture, or the remains of it. These are scratch marks from an archaeological site in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. The uh, scratches are produced by the earliest and simplest form of plough. For those who've read the book, it's the Ard, the Ard plough, basically a single spike that is dragged or pushed through the land to create grooves for uh, for, for paying the seeds, and they crisscrossed like that because each year they did it in a different direction. They alternated year on year on out. For some reason, this survived uh, four or five thousand years, buried under peat and so on. And today we can see a, a wonderful example of <coughs> Neolithic, Neolithic farming, and you know, uh, very earliest, earliest days. Here's a bit more modern. Uh, this is early medieval uh, uh, farming. Here, um, you may have probably done this at school because everyone used to do open field strip farming at school. And yeah, this is a, a picture of uh, Laxton in, uh, in Lincolnshire. Um, and this is interesting for a whole number of reasons. Uh, open field farming, I think, is fascinating because while it was very much a consequence of feudal society with a, a lord, you know, kings at the top, and then lords, and you know, the mass of the peasants at the bottom of society. Within that, you know, this was the lord's land, and people farmed it and were obligated to give a section of the, the crop they produced over to the. To, to the landlord, within that they attempted to organise it and to make it as good as possible. So each year, the peasants, and it's, what's interesting is this happened in Britain, but it also happened in places like you know, uh, uh, Russia or, or, or China, which had very similar forms of it, the strips were redistributed so that everyone didn't always have the bad bits of land. You know, there was a, an attempt to, uh, to, uh, to share things out so people survived. The other reason this is a fascinating picture is it's a classic example of class struggle imprinted on the British landscape. because. As capitalism developed and as the Middle Ages progressed, a process known as enclosure took place, where farms were, uh, were, were amalgamated, people were pushed off the land and uh, uh, eventually forced into the cities and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And the land were uh, enclosed into bigger fields, uh, which would then be taken over by larger farmers and, uh, and so on. And so you can see these hedges are the new enclosed fields, so there you have class struggle imprinted on the landscape in a, in a very, very concrete way. And this is a, a sad in some ways example of class struggle because all the majority of people in society, most of the peasants, were utterly defeated. They lost their lands. Uh, if they didn't become homeless and, hu and hungry and, uh, and die, they were forced into the cities. And, 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 and certainly in the early period of capitalism, they formed the basis for the new factory, uh, factories and uh, the labour in, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the cities. And the enclosures is a part of, uh, of, uh, of human, human history that is both a class struggle but also an ecological struggle because the people fighting against the enclosures and were trying to maintain a particular way of life, a particular relationship with nature at the same time as being uh, uh, a new one was being foisted and created. I'll come back to that, a couple more pictures. Here's a picture of a, a medieval 
uh, a medieval peasant and his, uh, and his plough. And here's how we do it in some parts of the world today. Um, I, I point this out because this is possibly the, this is uh, America, you'll be amazed to know. Uh, everything's bigger. Um, I point this out because this is the image that we have of farming today, where our food comes from. I doubt very much many people in here work on a farm like this, but this is how we imagine our food is, is produced. But for a large section of the world, this is not actually how the food is produced. Even today, with all the technology, with combine harvesters like this, with fertilisers and pesticides and all the rest of it, something like 400 million peasants feed a further billion people uh, farming like this, uh, with no petrol engines, with no electric tools, with no pesticides, with no fertilisers, just natural backbreaking human human labour. Um, and you know, I mentioned that scratch plough, the R plough, right at the beginning. Even as late as the 19th century, uh, people were still using those primitive ploughs in uh, in parts of parts of uh, of Europe. So the highly technolo technology, te the high technology uh, farming that we imagine feeds, feeds feeds quite a lot of people, but doesn't necessarily feed all people. And that's the, why that happens is one of the big big themes of the book. But the other problem, of course, is, is this isn't actually a very good way to feed people. For instance, some figures. 36 million Americans, the most powerful, wealthiest nation in the world, live in food insecurity. That means at least once a week they go without, without food. 36 million Americans, despite all the technology. Some, what is it, uh, uh, 400, um, I've lost the figure, I can't see where I'm in my notes. 925 million people in the world are undernourished. Now, interestingly, those are not necessarily the people whose food comes from the medieval ways of farming. Often they're people who have had this sort of farms imposed upon them, or this sort of, or, or, the, or their food comes through a, a production process that starts like this, but they can't afford their food. And again, again, I try and explore in the little book why is it is that some people, despite our ability to produce vast quantities of food, more food than is needed for uh, for people, can't can't afford to eat on such a such a level. Now. To go back to the ecological questions, uh, one of the interesting things is precisely how it is that the ideas and the approach to nature changes as, as society develops. So, for instance, in the book, I try and explore this by imagining what happens uh, when different way, people from different ways of organising society come into contact with each other. And the example I use, particularly in, in the book, is the uh, contact that takes place between the explorers from Europe and the colonists and the settlers who arrived in North America and their contact with the various different <coughs> Native American peoples that lived in, uh, in, the, in the, what they called the, the, new, the New World. Now, they, the Native Americans and uh, the people of the Americas lived in an enormous variety of different ways. The, 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 you imagine the, the big class societies of the Incas and the Maya, but also in the North you had hunter-gatherers who were never, you know, developed beyond the sort of lifestyle we, we, we saw those, uh, those, those cave paintings of in the past, you know, the uh, hunting bison, you know, gathering food, moving in a nomadic existence and so on, or people in the far north, the, uh, the Montague Nagy people, who I, I, I look at a little bit in Canada, who, who lived in a sort of hunting animals in a sort of tundra, uh, tundra uh, landscape. Now, the people on the left here, you can tell, are Europeans. Um, and the people on the right are, you know, some mythical, uh, noble, savage type imagery who are obviously all only too glad to see these highly technology uh, uh, people arriving on their shores. They're so glad to see them. They bought offerings, you know, natural offerings to, to give them. There's somebody giving over a bird and here. They they bought some food and a and a basket to, to give to the to the Europeans. Now, what you see, this is a obviously a highly romanticised and completely untrue picture of what actually actually happened. But if you imagine how did these two different groups of people imagine the natural world around them? On the right, you have a group of people who see the world and nature in terms of what you call its use value. They saw it in terms of what they could use to produce their clothing, their homes, the food that they could eat. They, they related to nature for what they, they needed. They had no concept of things like land ownership. It meant nothing. Property meant nothing. Because why, why would you own land when, you know, six months later you'll be moved on somewhere else? That said, they developed, and uh, the classic example of this is the landscape of New England, uh, they developed over centuries a highly efficient way of changing the natural landscape to improve the food that they could get from it. So they altered and shaped, they burned down trees, they cut down uh, uh, areas, they'd allow grassland to develop to improve the types of animals that lived and, and so on. So it wasn't a, a pristine natural landscape, it's one they, they had shaped in the interest of their own way of life. These people on the left, on the other hand, 
it's all nature in a very, very different way. I haven't got time to read it, but there, there's an example in the book of um, one of the explorers who's, uh, who's arrived in, uh, in, uh, in North America, and he writes letters home that are lists of trees. You know, I'd like a shopping list of trees, and there's a tree like this. There's a tree that reminds me of such and such a tree. There's a tree that produces a fruit like a plum. Why is he doing that? Because he's seeing nature in terms of its commodity, its ability to be traded, to be sold, to be exchanged, and, uh, and so on. And that clash, that, 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 that contradiction between the, the, two, the two tribes helps determine what happens to, 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 to the native people who are then pushed and, uh, and, and sidelined. Many of them die as a result of diseases and, and warfare. But also the, 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 the European settlers who they, they look at the natives and they say, I mean, they, they, I, I quote the letters because it's almost unbelievable to think of it now. They get these people are lazy, they spend all their time fishing. Fishing is what gentlemen do. We can have their land because they don't use it. And of course, they don't understand, of course, they are using the land, but they're using it in a very different way to how the uh, to, to, to people in, uh, in Europe would use, uh, would, use, would, use, would use land. And uh, so, they, so they change it. What, of course, happens is, uh, is the, you know, the, the, the Native Americans are sidelined in various ways, they're murdered, they're killed, they're, they're decimated. And uh, the nature of the North American continent becomes attached to a new way of organising society. It's attached to a, 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 an economy geared towards exchange and production for profits. And you get things like this, unfortunately it's laid out really badly for the room. Um, but these are, this is a picture of bison skulls hunted en masse. Now people, people know often that a lot of this was done... Uh, as, uh, 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 for, for sport, you know, people just massacre. There's so many of them. How can you kill all of them? So we'll just shoot as many of them for fun. These are actually being used for a conscious. These are collected together, and they're going to be ground down to be used as um, fertilizer for for the new agriculture in, uh, in Eastern Europe. But a sense really that now things are seen not in terms of how we can sustainably look after the bison and the buffalo for our future generations, but how can we make a quick profit out of uh, out of the, uh, the, the 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 killing of these of these animals. So how did we get to that situation? How did we get to the situation that people like this could come over from Europe and see nature in terms of commodities and, uh, and so on? And I argue that that's very much to do with the, the changes that take place in people's head when social change happens. And in particular, this is the transition from that feudal economy to the capitalist, capitalist economy, epitomised by, those, by that, that field, if you like, that's been, been enclosed. But a capitalist economy, as I said, that can... Start only sees the, uh, 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 the, the natural world in terms of its role in the production process. In England, there is an immense struggle that takes place in, in terms of that transition from feudalism to capitalism. The English Civil War, the English Revolution, we remember it in terms of Oliver Cromwell, the cutting off of Charles I's head, and interestingly, today's the anniversary of his burial after he'd had his, uh, had his head cut off. Um, and what happens during the English Civil War is a a massive revolution that involves millions, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, most of whom are links to the peasantry. Now, during the English Civil War, people remember there's lots of roving battles and armies and, and, and so on moving across Britain. And a lot of what the peasants did at that time was to try and stop people stealing the food off them. So the role, the eternal role of the peasant is always to stop people stealing the food that they've, they've, they, they've grown. But there were also other things that took place, more radical attempts to... Uh, to, to, to throw off the old order, but also to try and resist the changes that were coming from the new order. So people like Gerard Wynne Stanley and the diggers, the true levellers, who try to um, uh, uh, see a new way of doing it. Maybe we don't have to have rulers. Maybe the, the earth can be a common treasury for all, he said in 1649, in the sense that we use, you know, the people who do the work on the land should benefit from it. Why should we have to give stuff over to the... To the, uh, to, to, to the rulers, and they did amazing things. A declaration from the poor, oppressed people of England directed to them that call themselves, or are called, lords of manners. Um, you know, the, 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 the diggers were one small section of some of the, 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 the different things. There were lots of other examples of it. The, um, uh, my favourite story is the, uh, the lots of things that people throw, trying to open, uh, end enclosures, so all the fields had been closed. They tore down the hedges and cut down the fences, and they thought, well, you know, if we're getting rid of the king, we can have a bit of the land back type, type things. But my favourite story is the, uh, the peasants who, uh, who, um, who, who, who took the, the fish fry, you know, the little baby fishes from one of the rivers that belonged to the Lord to their own streams, and I thought, well, why should he have fish. Why can't we have some of them? So they move the little trout fly, you know, fly off into the thing. And I think it's a, a wonderful way of people saying, actually, how can we change nature in our interests and, the, and so on, in the midst of an almost class struggle. Unfortunately, the, the death of Charles I didn't mean that people like Winston Stanley got their, their, their hearing. In fact, exactly the opposite. What happens with the, the victory of the English Civil War, a world made safe for capitalism, uh, is the, uh, the chopping off of the king's head but then a clamping down on all the radical ideas. People like the levellers, the diggers were oppressed and, and closed. And, and really, that's, that triumph of the new order was also the defeat for the, for, the, for, for, for the peasants a second time, if you like, of Britain. Now, 
Increasingly what happens, you see accelerated enclosures and uh, driving more and more of people off the land. Oliver Cromwell started off the English Civil War by, uh, by being in favour of enclosures. By the end of it, he got a lot more land out of his, his involvement there, and he was uh, not interested in, uh, in, in stopping enclosure. He wanted to control that land and get rid of the, the peasants. And so what you really get from now on is a world where English agriculture and English farming and rural life is dictated by wage labour by people working on other people's land for a, job, uh, for a salary rather than to try and feed their farms. That doesn't mean that struggles don't take, don't, don't finish and agricultural struggles have been often a forgotten part of, of, of working class history in this, this, this country. The struggles of, uh, uh, of people to protect their jobs, their, their pay, their, 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 uh, to, to have jobs uh, and uh, be able to feed their families. Here's an example of, from 1830 of uh, a letter, some like people may have heard it, the swing, uh, the Captain Swing riots. And these were letters, there wasn't really a Captain Swing, but these were letters that were written and signed by the anonymous swing, spir- uh, uh, a swing, uh, which basically uh, were uh, part of the struggles of unemployed. I'll read it to you in a minute, don't worry if you can't read it. Um, the part of the struggles of people to make sure that they had decent pay, that they had jobs, and that machinery, things like threshing machines in particular, weren't, uh, weren't taking away their, their livelihoods. The letter reads... This is to inform you what you have to undergo, gentlemen, if providing you don't put down your machines and raise the poor men's wages. The married men give two and sixpence a day, the single men two shillings, or we will burn down your barns and you in them. This is the last notice. Uh, anyone who's ever been in the old and trade union negotiation would love to have <laughs> that escalation at the end of the night. One more pay, one more kill you <laughs> And so these struggles carry on for, for many years. And they're epitomised, I think, by this famous and wonderful po- uh, uh, poem. The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, but leaves the greater villain loose who steals the common from the goose. The sense that the... Is it, uh, five minutes, maybe? The sense that, uh, that, that, uh, that people had lost their common land, their rights, their, uh, their, their, their access, and, uh, and so on. And that poem, uh, uh, and nobody knows who did it, but it was printed up and posted up on pamphlets and, uh, and, and, and fly posters for, uh, for, for decades, for, for hundreds of years throughout, throughout these, uh, these struggles. And they form part of the sense of, for early, certainly in early capitalism, people wanting to go back to the land. You know, capitalism for them is just a temporary thing. We'll hopefully get our land back and one day we can go and farm that land again. And, uh, and live like our, our, our people in the past used to. Why do people want to live in dirty, horrible factories and, uh, and so on? Karl Marx saw this process as very much part, though, of something different. He saw it and understood it as it wasn't, there wasn't going to be going back. What had happened now was that capitalism had become in, in, entrenched, and the precondi- one of the preconditions for the entrenching of capitalism was the separation of the mass of the population from the, uh, uh, from the original source of, of wealth, the land. So there's that physical, forcible separation, the primi- primitive accumulation of wealth that drove labourers into the cities, that created the basis for the factory capitalism that was to arise in the 1800s and then uh, and, uh, and, and move on to, 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 to today. And that was, that, 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 that was really the end, certainly in Britain, of any, any, any peasantry, that, 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 that driving through, that finalisation of that transition to... To, to capitalism, which left us, as I said at the start, with a, a system that's geared uh, very much in terms of using nature and in terms of profit. Again, that doesn't mean that the struggles uh, of, of rural people have, have disappeared. Here's the, uh, the decree on land, which was the first decree signed by Lenin after the successful Russian, Russian Revolution at the end of the, end of the First World War. Um, and there's the, the poster that, that announces it. But the struggles continue today. The uh, peasantry was very much a part of the Russian, the Russian Revolution. But here on the bottom left here, we have the, uh, uh, a land occupation taking place a few years ago in Brazil by the landless workers' movement, a mass movement in Brazil that sees, seizes land, takes control of it, and tries to, uh, uh, to farm it in the interests of people who've got no jobs and, uh, and uh, 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 food and the rest of it. The Tunisian Revolution here in the middle. People struggling over the price of food and the, and, uh, and the cost of food. And they're on the right, a campaign against climate change, protest against, against uh, uh, fracking. Those struggles have still continue to take place. Um, but I want now in the final bit to talk a little bit more about, about, about capitalism and why it is that uh, capitalism is so incredibly destructive to the natural world. The system that is the result of all these struggles, that these struggles continue... Um, is, as Marx and Engels recognised, they didn't use the word unsustainable, but Marx and Engels understood that the, 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 the way that capitalism organised production couldn't survive in the long term. Engels wrote a little pamphlet called The Part Played, the 
part played by labour in the transition from ape to man. Um, and in it, he describes uh, an example of how in Cuba, some of the islands were coffee, they grew coffee in it, and the, 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 the capitalists growing coffee there for export realised that they burnt down all the trees, they could use the ash as fertiliser to make even more profits next year because it would improve the, the growth of plants. And they, and they did, and made enormous profits the, the year after. But then what happens, of course, is the rains that washed away the soil that had been held in place by the, by the trees. The deforestation destroyed the bases for the coffee industry on those, on those islands. And, uh, Engels used it as an example of how the logic of capitalism to make a profit in the very quick short term uh, can lead to the destruction of, uh, of, of, of the process in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in the future. Marx writes that uh, all progress in capitalist agriculture is progress in the arts, not only of robbing the worker, but of robbing the soil. A sense of you know, capitalism in, in agriculture that destroys <coughs> the basis, not just for the, the, the production in the, in the future, but also the, uh, the, the, the natural world itself. And Marx and Engels talked about a metabolic rift developing with capitalism, a, a, a separation between human society and the natural world that forms the basis for our, for our livelihood, a rift that is unhealable under, un, under capitalism because of the, the way that uh, 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 capitalist production is organised, a, a, a production being organised for profit, but driven by inherent logic that says we can uh, only make we have to make more profits to make more profits in the uh, in the future. The treadmill of production, the, the the accumulation of wealth for the sake of accumulation. That's the logic of capitalism, and uh, and it's why it's so incredibly uh, dis, uh, dis destructive. Um, but Marx and Engels also understood that there was an alternative, and they understood that it was possible to organise production rationally. They, you know, they understood that what capitalism had done, it had produced, it dev demonstrated that you could uh, use technology to, uh, to feed the world, you could use technology to do all sorts of wonderful, wonderful things, but they were limited, capitalism was limited by its need to make, to make profit. And they talked about organising and fighting and creating a world that, uh, that organised production, production differently, but that would heal that metabolic, metabolic rift. Um, Engels wrote in, in another little pamphlet of his called the, on the housing question, he noted how capitalism produced an antithesis between town and country. And the ab ab abolition of that antithesis was a practical <coughs> demand now of industrial and agricultural production. When one observes how here in London a greater quantity of manure than is produced in the whole kingdom of Saxony is poured away every single day into the sea with an expenditure of enormous sums, and what colossal structures are necessary to prevent this manure from poisoning the whole of London, then it's not a utopia to call for the abolition of the distinction between town and country. It's given a remarkably practical basis, and I think you know, he's using that little example. But I think if you think now about the way production for, I don't know, fossil fuels, the burning of fossil fuels, the desire to extract even more uh, fuels out of the ground, is, is both logical in the sense of those who want to make money, but completely and utterly illogical in the sense of those of us who want a world for our children and for our grandchildren. And I think, you know, we now have to say, how can we start to, uh, to, 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 to fight a different, um, a create a different way of organising society? And the last bit of the book, I won't talk about it now, looks at how, in the great moments of revolution, the great upsurges of struggle that working class people have engaged in, particularly the Paris Commune and the, the Russian Revolution, they've created those organs, those organisations of working class power that are both about fighting and struggle and winning strikes and protests and revolutions, but they are also about how can we organise society differently? How can we organise society for our needs, for the interests of us as a, as, the, as, as a whole population? Now, I would argue, we have to go a little further than that, say, how can we organise society in the interest of making sure that, uh, that we don't destroy the planet and the ability of humans to, to survive in the future? I just want to, to finish now, though, with a sense that this isn't a utopian dream that we've had uh, well, it is, a, in some sense, it's a utopian dream, but it isn't just, just that. It's been something that people have strived and hoped for for, for generations. Um, that poem I read at the beginning about the goose and the common, it doesn't finish with that, par that paragraph. It's, the rest of it is very rarely quoted. Uh, and I'll read it to you, because it gives a sense of people, a cr the cry of anguish and protest of what had been done to the people of, it, of England and the people of the peasantry. But it's also, it then calls for something more. The law, I'll start at the beginning. The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, leaves the greater villain loose who steals the common from the goose. The law demands we atone when we take things we do not own, but it leaves the lords and ladies fine who take things that are yours and mine. The poor and wretched don't escape if they conspire the law to break. This must be so, but they endure those who conspire to make the law. However, the law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, and geese will steal the common lap till we go and steal it back.